Thank you. You can be seated. Okay, first. Chumrat Sua. But hello, good morning. <laughs> oh, you translated. <laughs> Uh, it's really our privilege to be with you again. We love you and we love every chance we get to be here with you. It's also special to visit our grandchildren. Uh, we love your pastors. And several of you we've gotten acquainted with through the years. And with our family living here for 15 years, it means our hearts are with you. You are a beautiful church family. So beautiful, I want to take your picture right now. You like selfies? <laughs> Yum, 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 This side wins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this side wins. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the Bible. How many of you like stories? I love stories. But they can often have a strategic purpose to them. They're a way to carry important values and lessons from one generation to another. And they're special when they have special meaning to them. How many know the stories about the very smart rabbit who actually conquers the tiger? Yeah, I don't know those stories. <laughs> but he told me they're famous. <laughs> a rabbit conquering a tiger? Must be a Cambodian rabbit. <laughs> uh, in children's ministry, sometimes we tell a Bible story. And then we ask the children, what is the lesson of the story? One day a teacher was telling the story about Jonah and the whale. And she asked, what is the lesson of the story? And a little boy raised his hand. He says, I think people make whales sick. That's the lesson he got from the story. Another day, the story of David and Goliath. And the little girl said, Saul's soldiers thought Goliath was too big to kill. But David thought he was too big to miss. You're doing very well. Yeah. 
Thank you. <laughs> the greatest story of all is God's story. His stories are so true. They touch our hearts. And they have the power to change our lives. This is because life is inseparable from truth. In fact, all life actually illustrates truth. Everybody's life is illustrating truth. Whether positively or negatively. The Bible is over half, over half the Bible is stories. Over one third of Jesus' teaching was in the form of stories. There are 52 narrative parables in the Gospels. The disciples had a front row seat to all of his stories. And one day they asked him, why do you tell so many stories? In Matthew chapter 13, he gave this answer. He said it's to reveal truth to the humble. But to hide truth from the proud. The same story he would tell would confuse some people. But it would bring light to others. The difference was the state of their heart. How many of you want to have a humble heart today so that you can receive the truth? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Today I want to go to probably one of his most famous stories. It has been called the greatest short story in the world. It's called the story of the prodigal son. But I don't like that title. He didn't use that title. Because this story is more about the love of the Father. Than it is about the sin of the Son. This story was so important to Jesus that the, for the only time in the Gospels, he told two stories before it to prepare people to hear it. They are found in Luke chapter 15. And the theme of all three stories is the extreme joy of the lost being found. 
cứ cứ ăn tận đây rúm cứ miên này thà ầm nó đỏ đỏ lơ lụp nó cả đè đè vay mới đè bắt bóng bàn rót hơi mình It's the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But cứ chia riêng bảy, cứ riêng tì mui, cứ riêng chiếm đại vùng vây bắt tì pi riêng cạ, nó cạ đại chuột bắt hay năng riêng tì bảy cứ con pơ vùng vây đại đại vùng vây bắt. The only time recorded that Jesus told a triple story. But chẳng cứ chia pe và liêm mui đại ban trai anh ta bỏ ăn miếng bẹp bẩn tu là riêng bảy đại miếng ăn tận đây riêng cái này. Chop, chop, khnir. So why did he do this? Had they been to bang, chơi rơ thua bẹp nằng. The first two verses of the chapter tell us the situation. Và chẳng cứ copy đầm bông nó không chụp bông nó bàn phá bằng pi mua là hai đầm pi ở vay đại ca làng. There were people who were notorious sinners that were coming to Jesus. Cứ nó bẹp nó cứ miên mà nu mua chấm nuốt đại kê rót tha chia mà nu miên pháp hỏi bàn mà rót về Giêsu. To hear him teach. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were upset that he was relating to these sinners. He would even eat meals with them. Which the Pharisees were very offended by. So the occasion of these three stories was very tense. The Pharisees were upset with Jesus. And as we'll see, he was upset with them. The the Pharisees had a special name for people who did not keep their laws. They called them the people of the land. Which was a negative term. And they had special rules against these people. I'm going to quote some of them. They said, don't trust them with money. Don't allow them to testify in court. You can't trust them with a secret. Do not allow them to become a guardian of an orphan. Don't allow them to manage charitable funds. Don't go on a journey with them. Don't eat with them. Don't do business with them. That's serious prejudice. And to sum up the difference here, when Jesus says there is joy in heaven when a sinner repents, that's 
It is shocking to the Pharisees. Because this was their saying. There is joy in heaven when a sinner is destroyed. They couldn't have been more wrong. And this, this is the tension of these stories. They rejoiced when sinners were destroyed. That's what they look forward to. How many of you are glad that is not God's heart towards us? How many of you were a sinner that was lost? And through Jesus you are found. And how many are glad that heaven is rejoicing? Because you were saved. So here's our three stories. The first was about the lost sheep. Now, shepherding in Judea was a very difficult task. There were not many pastures, a lot of street, steep ravines. And with no restraining walls, sheep could easily wander into danger. Most flocks were not owned by one person. They would often be owned, owned by the village. So the shepherd wasn't just taking care of his sheep. He was taking care of everybody's sheep. So if he lost one, he would have to go find it and get its sheepskin and take it back to show the town. But if he found the sheep alive and brought it back, the whole, the whole town would be rejoicing. Because they all cared about that sheep. Jesus was letting us know how heaven feels when a sinner is found. Those that we may give up on or look down upon. God goes after. So when he says there's more joy in heaven over the one that was lost than the 99 who were not lost. But if you were part of the 99, you might be offended. Because 
Why do you care more about the one that went away than us 99 who stayed? Like the Pharisees looking down on the people who don't do well. But Jesus is cluing us in to the values of heaven. Don't be one of the 99 that just feels good about your position. The needs of others should be more important to us than our own security. Jesus is telling the 99 that they should care about the one more than their own security. You have been saved and become a part of this wonderful flock. But if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to care more about the ones that aren't here yet. Now, actually, going after the one affirms the value of the 99. Instead of the being 99, say, well, I never left. We should be saying, thank you, Jesus, because if something happened to me, you would come after me too. The second story is about the lost coin. A woman has ten silver coins. And she loses one of them. The mention, of, the mention of ten coins is probably referring to a woman's wedding headdress. A girl would save up for years to collect these ten coins. They would be linked together by a silver chain. In that day, it was the equivalent of like a wedding ring today. So when Jesus told the crowd she lost one of her coins, the crowd would go, oh no, she lost her wedding ring. And they understood how difficult it would to be defined in one of their houses. The houses of common people in Jesus' day were very dark. They would often have only one circular window. About that big. So not much light from the outside would come in. And the floor of the house would be uh, like beaten down dirt. 
và thái nữa ở đây cầm ra đây là tia bạc kê nó cứ về chia đây là cái bọc bạc là bằng hạt tê và chia đây đây mà mình sẽ mang về which they would cover over with dried reeds và chẳng có miên nữa ở đây là bằng hạt hay có miên nhưng hao ta chỉ bán để cái cà nó chờ anh bạc là chia đôi và chỉ bán khéo nó tiếc nó tiếc so in a dark room with a dirt floor covered by reeds và chẳng cứ nữa không có tốt tiếc đây là người ngất thôi One coin would be very hard to find. But the wedding ring would be so important. She would sweep out the whole house until she found it. Because the value of it was more than just the money. It was viewed as being so valuable to the, to a woman that the money could not these coins could not be taken from her even if she was in debt. Now as you listen to this story Your response determines whether you're like the Pharisees. Are you blaming the woman for losing her wedding ring? Or are you rejoicing with it? She found it. Turn to the person next to you and say, You're not a Pharisee. <laughs> okay, now for our final story. First, we see the lost son's selfishness. He wants his inheritance early. He demands it from the father. The father was not obligated to give it to him. But it wasn't unusual in those days for a father to distribute the inheritance before he died because he wanted to retire. But tragically, the son takes the inheritance and loses it. And he ends up feeding pigs, which a Jewish boy wasn't into. So coming to his senses, he decides to go home and repent to his father and ask to just become a servant. There were different levels of servants in that day. Some servants were treated actually as members of the family. But when he refers to being a hired servant, he's, he's referring to the lowest rank of servants. They were like day laborers who could be dismissed in a day's notice. 
và chẳng cứ chiến đấu vòng ra để miền thành tiếp đại kê ai phải chốc kê ai phải đánh tranh vì tiếp pena của bạn. So he comes back very humbly with no expectation. Chẳng có tập lập mà vinh cật nhẹ lực hai co đòi khuyên nơi ca rừng băng thạch trong ban ấy cao tập pi thôi chiến đấu vòng ra tiếp chẳng kê nập tiếp phục. At this point in the story, all of the Pharisees would have a strong opinion of the son. Và chẳng cứ nó không rương nơi hàng cái nắp bà sĩ kê sẽ đáp bài kê tam đan miền tên cất đầm pi con phò mà nè nè. How could he do that to the father? How could he live in such sin? The father should not take him back. But aren't you glad that's not how our father is? He was watching for the son's return. He saw him a long way off. And the father had already forgiven him in his heart. Because he interrupts the son's repentance. He doesn't say, now confess all your sins. Prove to me that you are changed. Show, show me that you really want to be forgiven. He's embracing his son. He gives him the finest robe. He gives him a ring which represents trusting him with family authority. And when it says he gave him shoes, it's saying you are going to be treated not like family, not one of those hired servants who were never given shoes, by the way. And he throws a party saying, my son has returned from the dead. But then Jesus refers to the older brother. Still referencing the Pharisees. Who would be upset that the father's rejoicing over the son. And remember they would rather see a sinner destroyed than saved. The older brother had an attitude of begrudging his service to the father. He rejects his younger brother because he says he's your son rather than my brother. And he focuses on how bad his brother's sin was. And because he's the one that mentions prostitutes, which is not mentioned earlier in the story. He focuses on how bad the sin is instead of how wonderful his father's forgiveness is. And are you getting the lesson of the stories? Have they been made plain enough? Jesus tells it three times to make sure we get it. Today, if you are away from God, 
You can identify with the sheep. Maybe you wandered away, not meaning to get lost. You might identify with the coin. You feel you were misplaced by someone else. Or maybe you know you're like the sun because you've made wrong choices. Trying to do life apart from your father. Please know this. He is searching. He is sweeping. And he is longing for you to come home. Now, if you are serving God already, you should identify with the shepherd, the woman, and the father. Do you find your greatest joy in the recovery of the lost? Are you just proud of being in the 99? Let's don't judge the lost, let's embrace the lost. Anybody want to be a Pharisee? Don't raise your hand right <laughs> now. How many want to be like Jesus today? Let me conclude with this question. Where is Jesus right now? He's standing at the outside door saying, Come on, let's go get them. God bless you.